the cloud. And I'm still letting some people in. But again, welcome. We've had some more people join since all that. Now, my name is Mary. So I'm the health educator here at Arthritis New South Wales, so located in Sydney. Um, you'll see my face quite a bit in these webinars as I'm uh, the primary person delivering these. So I'm the one who hears the feedback. I want to hear from you guys what you think of these webinars, what you want to learn about. I'm usually the one who's at the end of the info line um, uh, answering all you, the questions you have about your condition as well. So hopefully um, we're putting a face to the name now. So just a little bit of background on myself. I have a background in nutrition and public health. I've been with the organisation for a little bit now. And uh, yeah, I love educating on health topics. And this is kind of like where I'm a bit biased. I love talking about nutrition and food and diet. So Again, feel free to engage and connect with me, ask lots of questions. Um, I'm super excited for this webinar program we have coming up. As you would see this year, we have a whole bunch of topics that we're actually covering. Um, so feel free to go through the list of web upcoming webinars. Uh, feel free to register for those. Um, you might notice that I disappear for a little bit and that's just because I've got a little baby on the way. Um, so she'll be coming in June. <laughs> so you might see a few months where I'm not around, but I will be coming back to um, jump in around September, October. So just let me know if everything sounds okay, everything looks okay on the screen. If there's any um, kind of issues, don't hesitate to raise them with me. You'll see at the in the taskbar, the Zoom taskbar, you'll see a chat box. I would love for you guys to use that for all your questions. Um, if you have any comments, if you want to um, participate in any discussion, please feel free to use that chat box. As we go through this, I will um, please ask you guys to turn your microphones on mute just because sometimes we get a bit of feedback that comes through and it can be a little bit disruptive and um, cause the sound to mess up for some people. So I actually just had a good question. Are these webinars the same as on Arthritis Queensland website? They are. So we um, pretty much come together with the Arthritis Queensland team and that's why you either see me or sometimes Brianna Jones who uh, delivers some of these webinars, but we're across both organisations. So as I said before, nutrition is an exciting topic. I love talking about it. In today's uh, webinar, we're going to be talking a little bit about um, the research that exists so far. So we'll start off with covering a little bit about what's in the guidelines um, in terms of osteoarthritis management in the context of nutrition. And then we'll dive a little bit deeper into that inflammation diet connection because I'm sure that you might have heard about it you probably just want to understand a little bit more about it. And then at the end, we'll go through some tips, give you some tricks to help improve your nutrition if that this is something you really want to work on. And I can assume if you're here tonight that it is probably um, something that's playing on your mind and um, you're ready to be motivated. So just a little disclaimer that all our presentations contain really general information and advice. So we do our due diligence to make sure that all the information we present is based on the latest evidence. Um, it's accurate. It's reliable. If you do have questions that relate to your individual treatment advice or medications or your condition, Sometimes I'll direct you um, and ask you to bring that up with your doctor or your primary healthcare physician, um, but I'll do my best to answer any questions as they relate to our session tonight. So just while I'm letting some people in, I want to hear from you guys. What do you know about the arthritis, um, about arthritis and the diet? <laughs> Not very much. Not very much. Okay. Very little. Agree. Very little. <laughs> uh, all I know is that you shouldn't eat tomatoes. I don't know if that's still applicable. Okay. Interesting you bring that up. 
I've heard that you shouldn't eat nightshade plants. Okay, the nightshades is an interesting one and it comes up a, a lot of the times actually. Um, I don't know where that evolved from, but we will come back to that if it's still a question that's on your mind at the end of this webinar. Um, keep in mind, we have another three webinars after tonight that cover more things about nutrition, somewhere we might actually talk about nightshades. Sugar and okay. alcohol. Sugar and alcohol, what do we know about that? Moderation or no sugar, little, little sugar, very little sugar. Okay, let's jump into it. So nutrition, of course, plays an incredibly important role in terms of why someone might develop disease, but also why it could continue to get worse. And so if we look at some of the reasons someone can get osteoarthritis, we know that mechanics play an important role. So excess load we know can affect structural integrity mm. of certain joints, mm. particularly in those load-bearing ones, the knees, the hips, sometimes the uh, feet. And that links in with carrying excess weight. But then there's also an inflammatory component that we're starting to learn about. So we understand it really clearly from a mechanical perspective, but what we're starting to learn more about is that there is an inflammatory um, component. And so there might be certain factors in the diet that can either dial up that inflammation or mm. uh, reduce it. Mm. So the thing about osteoarthritis is that it is a disease of the whole joint. So when I say that, it's not a condition that just affects the cartilage like we once believed. Um, joint is made up of bone, cartilage, ligaments, muscle, and different tissues. So when we break down what makes up these tissues and the structures, they're actually mostly dietary factors, all which play into how the joint is made up how healthy it is, or vice versa, how much the joint can be impacted. And I will just pause quickly because I can hear some feedback coming through. Would it be okay to make sure that those microphones are off? And then I'll tell you when to switch them back on so we can have some discussion. So continuing back to um, my chat about the joint, we know bone and cartilage are mostly calcium, vitamin D, vitamin K. You have minerals thrown in there. We have protein that makes up the muscle that actually surrounds the joint. And then we also have inflammatory substances and hormones that can be influenced by how much sugar we eat, um, how much trans fats we consume, how much hydrogenated oils are in the diet. So there's all these things that can actually um, influence that inflammatory response in the body. So what we know from the best current data is that osteoarthritis isn't just caused by um, not exercising enough, carrying excess weight, um, lacking certain nutritional factors like vitamin D, calcium, vitamin K. It can actually be compounded by these factors. So it may have a role in worsening the state of that condition. So when we dive really deep into things like risk factors, what's important to realize is that a lot of them are actually modifiable. And what we mean by that is that they can be controlled and addressed through things like exercise and diet. And so I'm sure all of us at some point have been told that we need to work on getting our vitamin D levels up and we need to get those calcium levels up for bone health. But there's other nutritional risk factors that we don't always talk about that can actually influence inflammatory processes in the body, like high cholesterol, high blood sugar levels, um, high blood pressure. And so when we think about those things, we often just jump straight into um, you know, cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, we don't always talk about their potential role in arthritis. So research is suggesting things like excess fat tissue um, can produce inflammatory hormones, which can um, basically accelerate that breakdown of particular structures in the joint. High blood sugar levels and cholesterol might have a negative effect on bone mineral density and affect that bone health. 
And then you have muscles that actually need sufficient protein to maintain their mass and their strength around joints to make sure that um, that force isn't, um, you know, stressing out those joints. So what I am guess I'm getting at here is that the pathology of osteoarthritis is really complex. So is the pathology for rheumatoid arthritis. But um, we're starting to kind of gather more research around how modifying certain things in the diet can lead to lower and few, fewer side effects of osteoarthritis and disease activity and infl inflammatory attacks and all that. So um, there is no diet proven to cure arthritis. A question we get all the time is, what can I eat to fix my arthritis? We can't actually answer that with a blanket answer, but we do know that improving nutrition can really help with that symptom relief uh, from both a weight management perspective and from a dietary perspective when we talk about things like active ingredients. Uh, did I get someone coming through that microphone? Yes, that's me. It's Jane Boyd. I haven't been able to hear a word since it began. Um, oh, I think okay. I can hear you now. I, I had my volume full full up high, you know, and um, but I couldn't hear the lady speaking and I've tried everything, but oh, I can no. hear you speaking now. I don't know um, if I can hear the actual meeting though. Okay, that's interesting. Is anyone else having those same issues? I'm just on my mobile phone. No issues here. Okay. And maybe oh, no just issues. Jane, I can, just assume, I can assume yeah. it might be a tech error. Um, just to know that if anything happens uh, midway through this presentation, it is being recorded. So it will be uploaded to our website. And if you want to come back and watch um, what we just covered in that first half, you can always do that. Yeah. How long does this go for? Uh, give it maybe 45 minutes to an hour. Yeah. Oh, anyway, oh. thank you so much. Thanks, um, Jack. So it's on, it'll be recorded on the website. Yes. Yeah. So I just yeah. encourage everyone to um, turn their microphones off and we'll continue on with the session. Um, yeah. So what we're looking at here are the Royal Australian College of General Practitioner uh, clinical guidelines. So this is pr pretty much what informs um, the management for osteoarthritis and the recommendations that are given to you. So from a weight management perspective, we know diet can have a huge impact on weight and load. And so we have a lot of data that actually suggests carrying excess weight can absolutely worsen symptoms. And that what, something like weight loss um, in someone who is currently overweight, so passing that BMI, um, that body mass index of 25, can make a really meaningful difference to pain symptoms. From a dietary perspective, we know certain nutritional factors like vitamins, micronutrients, antioxidants are essential for things like maintaining bone health, maintaining muscle mass and inflammation, all the things which could help not only with maintaining kind of those structures in the joint, but also helping with pain relief and pain symptoms and that's where we're going to hone in on the research um, shortly. So you'll see here that weight loss, again, for people with a body mass index over 25 is known to have a really positive effect on osteoarthritis management. If you don't know what your body mass index is, you can always check that with a GP or you can jump onto the Heart Foundation website and they have a BMI calculator. It's very good to know what uh, where that stands. Um, you'll see that weight loss exercise is a great intervention. The only reason it's a conditional recommendation is because there is some level of personalization required um, in that intervention. And what I want to drive your attention to here is that um, you can see a conditional recommendation against um, things like omega-3 fatty acids being supplements and vitamin D supplementation. This isn't because it's not an effective intervention. It's just because the research isn't quite there yet 
to say that this works for this condition or this doesn't work for this condition. It's kind of very um, convoluted at the moment. And so this is why we do what we do. We share with you the information so you can make your own informed decisions about which way you want to go with your treatment. But nutrition research, it's really complex. We know diet can have a really big impact on health, um, but understanding how exactly diets, food choices, behaviours affect health exactly, it's quite tricky. So when researchers say that if certain foods and diets are linked to health conditions, doesn't necessarily mean that this food directly causes this disease. Um, it's just more like observing that this disease or this health condition seems to appear a lot in people who have um, regular intakes of this food or this type of dietary pattern. So it's really hard to kind of prove a cause and effect relationship. Does that make sense to everyone? Yes. Okay, that's great. If I lose Pardon any... Me, I'm just... sorry to interrupt. Feel free, yes. Yeah. Shouldn't you take vitamin D because I'm on vitamin D? We're going to hold on to that thought because we're coming up to vitamin D shortly. All right, sorry. <laughs> Jumping Stay in with me. Um, yeah. yeah, so I guess going back to the context of arthritis, which is what we all want to know about here, um, we have evidence suggesting that what we eat might be connected to the risk of developing arthritis or it progressing, um, but it also might be able to help improve the condition, um, but it also might not. So it's kind of, um, you know, up to us to ch take that information, take that evidence and um, look at, you know, how um, appropriate it is for our individual situations. And this is why we have people like GPs and physios to ask these questions too. And so going to the diet, a question that comes in a lot, um, do certain foods make a difference to inflammation? And the simple answer is yes. So there are foods that can lead to increased inflammation. Like we know that there are foods that are more processed um, they're higher in trans fats, saturated fats, added sugars. They also lack in fiber and have a number of different pro-inflammatory effects in the body. And this is due to how they affect things like the gut microbiome, how they affect the regulation of the immune system. We're starting to learn more about how these components affect inflammation in the joints. But it's also not just about what foods... Um, but how much food we eat, that can make a difference to inflammation as well. And this is why we talk about the importance of portion size control. There are some foods, um, particularly if they're eaten in excess amounts and over a period of time, that can contribute to weight gain. And fast food is one of like the best examples we have of this because often this type of food, it contains a lot, a lot of energy, um, but very little nutrients. And so it does have um, that effect to induce weight gain. On the contrary, we have foods that are known to contain anti-inflammatory properties. So we have fatty fish, we have um, krill, flaxseed oil, avocado, foods with very powerful omega-3 properties. Um, we have foods like eggs, mushrooms, milk um, that are rich in vitamin D. But then we also have supplements um, when we can't, can't quite get those nutrients from food. And there are so many other foods that can deliver these benefits as well. And this is why we hear a lot of hype around plant-based foods, fruits, vegetables, herbs, whole grains, legumes. It's because of how they can impact health. And we actually have data on that. So what does the evidence say? Saturated fat, which is often found in animal-based foods, tropical oils, processed foods, very abundant in our Western diets, has been linked with increased cartilage damage in people with osteoarthritis. So we're going to look at the research that was done to kind of establish that. There's other evidence that suggests that omega-3s, um, often found in those foods like fish, nuts, seeds, supplements, have modulatory effects on rheumatoid arthritis, meaning they could interfere with the immune system to help <laughs> reduce inflammation. 
And then we also have um, that weight management component. So in the Australian Dietary Guidelines, we have grade A evidence. We have the best level of evidence that exists to suggest that overconsumption of food increases adipose tissue, which is just um, technical for fat tissue. We also have that having a diet high in fat can influence energy intake, meaning that it contains a lot of calories, which can impinge on weight management. There's also grade A evidence to tell us there's a positive relationship between portion size and body weight. So things that are becoming more and more important risk factors to address in osteoarthritis because of the widespread um, it, uh, effects excess weight has on both biomechanics of the joints and the inflammatory processes that are implicated in not just osteoarthritis, but rheumatoid arthritis as well. So we know that excess weight can place a lot of stress on the knee and hip joints. But what's really interesting here is that there is a relationship between excess weight and hand arthritis. So why this is interesting um, because uh, we can't really have mechanical stress on the hands due to excess weight. And so we can't have really um, symptoms that come on from excess load because our hands don't really carry the excess uh, weight. So this is what's telling us that there could be many metabolic factors involved due to circulating inflammatory molecules in the context of someone carrying excess weight. So from a dietary perspective, this is why saturated fat specifically has been a real strong area of interest, particularly with its devious role in arthritis. So very recently, there's been studies conducted by researchers that have looked at the effects of a high fat, high carbohydrate diet on the joints and overall health in rats. We know that rats are very different to humans, but what's um, relevant here is that it's a dietary pattern that's very common to our Western diets here in Australia. So because there is really clear evidence that saturated fats and simple carbohydrates are abundant in this dietary pattern, and they're known to contribute to a pro-inflammatory state in the body through several mechanisms, in theory, these dietary components might have um, a role in mounting an immune response that contributes to the prolonged breakdown and weakening of um, those tissues we talked about in the joints before, particularly in the cartilage. So that's really interesting to us. And we have experimental research that has looked at the impacts of a diet containing not just simple carbohydrates, but 20% saturated fats um, on osteoarthritis with results confirming that this may have been responsible for producing the osteoarthritic-like changes that were observed in the knees of these rats. So they found that the rats who had this diet with a lot of saturated fat experienced weakening of the cartilage, which made it a lot more prone to damage. And so these findings, why they were interesting is that they suggested that one, osteoarthritis was a result of more going on in the metabolism as opposed to just that wear and tear we once believed about arthritis. And two, that diet has a lot to do with these changes. If we look at another study that investigated a very similar relationship, it looked at 2,100 participants over a um, time period of four years to confirm if there was a dose response relationship between saturated fat intake and joint space width loss in the knee. So what they did is they looked at how many calories were coming in the diet from just from saturated fats. Um, and they found that people, the group of people who were consuming the highest amount of saturated fats had greater changes in the x-rays that actually showed radiographic progression of osteoarthritis. So they were able to confirm that individuals who had diets high in saturated fats had a 60% greater risk for osteoarthritis progression. So not only were these weight changes observed as well, but altered joint loading. 
So just to summarize this really quickly, results of this study basically complemented that previous study we showed you with the rats and suggested that diet containing high amounts of saturated fats could be a risk factor and worth addressing um, and make sense as to why it could possibly help. So I know that it's all well and good to be told, like, this is a research, this is um, what could be contributing to osteoarthritis progression, but we probably want to know where saturated fats are found and how do we reduce them. So animal products for one, so fatty cuts of meat, poultry with skin, processed meats, full fat dairy products. Um, tropical oils, particularly those palm oils, palm kernel oil, and processed and packaged foods. So think of um, those commercially baked goods, the cakes, the cookies, the crackers, snack foods, fried foods, fast food. Um, so these are the foods that have been associated with not just, um, you know, potential risk of osteoarthritis progression, but they're implicated in many, many health issues. So uh, of course they can be part of a balanced diet, which is why we talk a lot about moderation and watching our consumption of these foods, but place more emphasis on what to bring in. So we'll come back to that. So when it comes to active ingredients and the role of nutrients, this is where a lot of interest seems to um, be. So I don't want to make it too complex for everyone, but I do want to highlight why there is certain hype about certain nutrients. So we'll start with the omega-3 fatty acids because these get a lot of attention in osteoarthritis and rheumatoid arthritis. Um, and there's also really clear evidence of its anti-inflammatory benefits. So omega-3s are found in your foods like fish, flaxseed, I mentioned them before, but walnuts, um, avocados. They're also found in your dietary supplements like fish oil. So they're known to have very powerful, but very specific immune-mediated mechanisms of actions. To put that simply, um, thanks to their EPA and DHA contents, um, they're able to basically promote the resolution of inflammation in the body, help dampen that inflammatory response. And this relates to its effects in being able to help reduce inflammatory markers in the body that are often elevated in people with osteoarthritic joints, rheumatoid arthritis, and they may be implicated in pain and cartilage loss in um, certain types of arthritis. So there've been many, many studies that have looked at how effective omega-3s are, all which have drawn very inconsistent conclusions. But I wanna focus on the one piece of research that's been really um, promising to us. So very recently we had research to the level of a meta-analysis, which is basically the creme de la creme of research. It's um, a fantastic, very rigorous process in studying something. And it involved nine randomized controlled trials with the involvement of 2,070 adults with osteoarthritis. So these studies all aimed to comprehensively evaluate the influence of your omega-3s on symptom and joint function in patients with osteoarthritis. And the results are really promising with an overall benefit seen in both pain and function. I do need to highlight that this research was based on supplementation as opposed to food, but the results still complement the research that exists on the benefits of increasing things like fish in the diet, increasing nuts and seeds um, due to their omega-3 contents. So it's generally recommended to obtain omega-3 fatty acids from food anyway. Um, we always say that supplements are meant to supplement what's missing in the diet. and um, this is because foods contain many other beneficial nutrients like proteins, other vitamins, other minerals that are essential for good health. And what we should probably go back and revisit is that, do you guys remember when I showed you the clinical guidelines, how there was a recommendation, a conditional recommendation against these supplements? 
This is really because um, the evidence for most is quite minimal. So we don't have a lot of good, hu good uh, quality human clinical trials to show that, yes, this food um, is inflammatory or this food is anti-inflammatory or this um, dietary supplement does this exactly. But there are observations that have been made and there is a building evidence base. And um, this is what we're looking at here is that this piece of evidence we've pulled out here has good effects on symptom management. So going back, re reminding us that because research isn't quite there yet, um, we don't really know how these, how much of these food sources we should be eating to get that therapeutic benefit from these foods. But we have enough general evidence to suggest that um, in order to get the health benefits from omega-3s, two to three servings of fatty fish per week is sufficient. Of course, not everyone likes fish. Not everyone has access to fish either, especially if you're probably in a rural, remote area where the ocean isn't far. Maybe you have access to frozen fish. Um, we also know that sardines, anchovies, probably not to everyone's taste. So before taking any supplement, um, of course, you should consult with your doctor or um, talk with a pharmacist so they can do their due diligence to make sure there's no interactions. It's safe for you to take. They can talk about appropriate dosage with you. But of course, if you can't get those food sources in the diet, that's where a supplement might be beneficial. It's just always important to talk about uh, that with a professional especially someone who knows your medical history and what medications you're taking. So just very quickly, the bottom line is that omega-3s can be really great for our health, um, should be part of a well-balanced diet. Um, they might help with improving inflammatory pain and improving function. We need more evidence to say, but there's no harm in, um, you know, speaking about it with your doctor. So we'll talk about the next um, best thing here is protein. So when we think about our muscles and the way they support our joints, it's really essential to try and maintain or build that muscle mass to help dissipate the forces on a joint like the <coughs> knees or the hips. Um, so when it comes to supporting our physiology and supporting that muscle mass, we need protein to help make that up and maintain its integrity. So we need protein for all our cells to grow, repair, heal, function. It's really a key ingredient for not only building muscles, but preventing that muscle loss, which becomes more and more important as we get older. Um, so when our protein requirements aren't being met, uh, this can affect oh. muscle breakdown. And how that affects our arthritis is that the less muscle we have available around our joints, particularly those knees and in the hips, the more load and the more force they're going to have to bear. So this is why if you're exercising, um, we need the, that protein coming in to help make that muscle available um, and make sure that protein intake is adequate. And this is where it can be really beneficial to speak with the dietitian, um, someone who can assess what you're eating um, or what you need to be eating. Usually, if your diet is balanced and you're getting enough of all five food groups, you might be meeting your recommended protein intake. But if again, if you're not sure, it's always really beneficial to actually talk to someone um, about your diet. And so if you're wondering um, where we get our protein from, you know, things like lean cuts of meat, you can get it from yogurt, you can get it from cheeses, um, tofu there's lots of alternative sources if you don't eat um, animal products if you're vegetarian or vegan so um, there's a lot of different ways you can meet those protein requirements with healthy sources as well so just um, antioxidants now we these have received a lot of attention so vitamin c being particularly relevant owing to its requirement for collagen formation. Um, collagen is one of those uh, structural components we see a lot of in the joint. Vitamin E, on the other hand, is said to be protective by 
reducing activity of free radicals. If you're wondering what a free radical is, um, you're not alone, but these are pretty much the substances which are said to be responsible for causing um, lots of stress and functional damage in lots of tissues. So there's a lot of claims that have been made that suggest they might be able to provide symptomatic relief and might be able to protect uh, various cells and tissues in the body. And so what I want to go back to is the theory here. So oxidative stress is one of those uh, proposed mechanisms that underpin joint and bone degeneration in all kinds of arthritis. So oxidative stress basically occurs when there's too many free radicals that are circulating in the body and are said to maybe trigger inflammation in arthritis. They're usually created in part of the inflammatory response. Um, so again, they're known to damage different cells and tissues in the body, including those cells in the bone, cells in the cartilage, tendons, ligaments. And this is where antioxidants have become a growing area of interest. Not only are they able to help calm an inflammatory response, but provide that protection. So they're not, we're not saying that they can actually reverse structural damage in osteoarthritis, but they might offer potential benefits. So what you're seeing here, I'm not going to cut to the core of all these studies and I'm not going to make it too complex, but um, vitamin C is one of the most potent antioxidants, which has been studied a lot. Um, particularly in the context of osteoarthritis management. So this is why vitamin C gets a lot of hype. What I want to highlight is that out of 12 human trials, only two studies focus on um, vitamin C coming in through food intake as opposed to vitamin C supplementation. And what they found in these studies that there was notable reductions in pain scores um, that were assessed in people eating lots of vitamin C, that other studies um, looked at improved quality of life. And occasionally there was a reduction or decreased use of painkillers. So what this tells us is that it could be a good area to look more into. At present, we don't really have that data to show you there's a direct benefit from this supplementation. But if you plan on increasing your intakes of foods with vitamin Cs, and um, what those foods are, we're looking at berries, spices, herbs, vegetables, eggs, um, tomatoes, kales. Antioxidants can be found in a variety of fruit, um, foods, particularly those plant-based foods. And incorporating a diet rich in these are always going to be great for our health. But we do need more research um, to look at potential links between circulating antioxidants taken from the diet and how well they actually um, work to protect against oxidative stress. So addressing that oxidative stress and might help with inflammation associated with different types of arthritis. But again, we always um, need to put that disclaimer out there saying we need to do more to understand this. So continue eating plenty of veg, plenty of fruit, nuts, seeds, fish, herbs, spices. Um, they contain a lot of those essential nutrients that are not only going to support good health, but those joints as well. So as you may know, we have this question come in before about vitamin D. Um, and we should know that it's very important for bone health. It plays a really important role for absorbing calcium and other minerals that are essential for supporting that healthy bone. Lack of vitamin D is what we know to be a strong risk factor for bone loss, which can lead to weakened and vulnerable bones. So can result in bone pain, can result in muscle weakness and increased risk of falls and fractures. So why this is relevant is because, again, osteoarthritis, it does have a component where it affects the bone. So I hope it makes sense as to why we should be thinking about um, that bone health in arthritis as well. So in 2014, which I know it was a while ago, um, but the research was still quite relevant, 
they looked at vitamin D levels in people with or at risk of osteoarthritis. One study they published in the Journal of Nutrition discovered that those with low vitamin D levels had more than double the risk of knee osteoarthritis progression um, compared to those with high levels of vitamin D concentrations. There was another one that complemented that, and they found that older adults who have vitamin D deficiency were more likely to experience um, new or worsening knee pain over the course of five years. So while correcting those vitamin D levels could be beneficial, um, particularly for knee osteoarthritis, it's unclear whether restoring those vitamin D levels will actually improve those things. Now for rheumatoid arthritis, um, vitamin D deficiency actually seems to be one of the most common nutritional deficiencies we see in people and could be worthwhile correcting. Not only is it good for bone health, but it really has a powerful effect on the immune system. Um, it helps immune cells function correctly. It helps with inflammatory responses um, and may have an ability to suppress production of pro-inflammatory markers in the body. And so there is a relationship here. There's a couple of studies to suggest um, they found that as vitamin D levels drop, RA um, disease activity tends to increase. And you would know that if you have a rheumatoid arthritis, there's ebbs and flows in disease activity and ebbs and flows in your symptoms. Um, but here, this is where they suggest that those with really low vitamin D levels, they do often experience more severe disease, greater disability and lower quality of life. So that maybe keeping those vitamin D levels in check, it could be uh, really beneficial for keeping um on top of that rheumatoid arthritis and managing it. So although the potential role of vitamin D um, in preventing the development of slowing or reducing the progression of osteoarthritis and attenuating disease activity, rheumatoid arthritis is under investigation. At this point, there's really no compelling reason to actually Supplement your diet with vitamin D just for slowing down the progression of osteoarthritis or um, managing rheumatoid arthritis, but getting adequate vitamin D through things like sun exposure, um, getting it through the diet, making sure you're supplementing if you're vitamin D deficient, are uh, going to be important for overall well-being, bone health, osteoporosis prevention, and healthy immune system function. So you can't go wrong with correcting those vitamin D levels. So bottom line, we want to make sure we're getting plenty of sunshine, um, plenty of vitamin D rich foods. Um, if you haven't, get those vitamin D levels checked. You can do that easily through a, um, a blood test and you would have to ask your doctor to do that. It might or might not help uh, that um, your arthritis, but it will definitely help your bones. So who's heard of the Mediterranean diet? Has anyone tried it for themselves? Anyone an advocate themselves? Yes, and it's supposed to be the best diet. Okay, let's look at it. All the time. <laughs> so there's a lot of different iterations of different diets, um, but it's really not about dismissing potential benefits or drawbacks from specific foods for fighting inflammation. But it's really a lot better to focus on the whole diet, um, your whole lifestyle, rather than just trying to hack your way into it. We know turmeric, it's, um, we love our turmeric lattes and um, matcha oh, well green done. teas for inflammation. But I mean, we don't want to just jump to those and think job is done. This is why in the context of arthritis, Mediterranean diet specifically yeah. has got a lot of attention. So a Mediterranean diet is really a well-rounded diet that emphasizes on not just the quality of foods, but foods that are rich in all your vitamins, your minerals, your antioxidants um, that are associ associated with reducing inflammation, promoting a healthy weight, and providing all those nutrients that are going to be great for your joint health. So it's one of the most comprehensively studied diets 
um, that isn't just supported by observational studies, but different randomized control trials and known um, for its role in being able to prevent disease like uh, cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, and helping maintain that healthy weight. Um, I'm not going to delve into too much of this today, and this is just because next week, Next week it is. Um, there will be a webinar that focuses more on the Mediterranean diet, looks at the research, but um, just to cut to the chase with it, um, you'll see that Mediterranean diets, they are typically dominated by fruits, vegetables, healthy fats, legumes, whole grains, um, and adding in fish and lots of olive oil. So it focuses on enjoyment. Um, it's very palatable and it's there's a lot of good reasons behind why um, we all advocate for this diet. So we did talk a little bit about weight management and again, we have a webinar coming up in the future that focuses specifically on weight loss principles and how to achieve it, why it's beneficial. But what I want to say here is that even if you're a little bit overweight or you're a lot overweight, <laughs> losing just even 5% of your total body weight has proven to, res um, proven to result in improved movement, function, inflammation, and pain. So this is where nutrition really has a powerful role. If we look at people who are successful at taking weight off um, and most importantly, keeping it off, these are a few of the key strategies that seem to be fundamental in any long-term solution for weight loss and weight maintenance. So a great starting point, if you don't know where to begin, is to connect with someone, a professional, a dietitian or a nutritionist. They're equipped with knowledge and skills to help assess that body mass index, determine those realistic and appropriate goals, and help you formulate the best plan to achieve them while keeping you accountable. Another really simple strategy, um, so simple that it really puts to shame all that complex diet information out there. I'm sure if you've ever been on Google, you typed in um, what's the best diet to follow, you get a whole thousands and millions even, um, all this information out there that you have to sort through. But Something as simple as mindfulness can be really powerful. It can be described as learning to pay attention to the present moment experience. Um, and so applying this principle to eating can be as simple as focusing on um, what is currently being eaten, removing distractions, um, you know, taking in the taste of food as it's eaten really slowly, and even um, having that method to simply recall what you've eaten recently can be a real game changer for changing those future decisions about what you're eating and how much to eat. So reducing portion sizes, the larger the serving of food, um, the bigger the container, the more likely it is that we're going to eat more of that food. So this is what can easily lead to passively overeating. It's known to impinge on weight gain, so eating foods from smaller bowls, plates, cups is one way of being able to actually control that. And now looking at the rest of these recommendations here, I'm sure you've heard of them all before. Increasing those nutrient-rich foods, reducing intake of discretionary foods, focusing on fiber, choosing fat sensibly. I hope after the information and research we went through tonight together, it makes you understand why the there is a lot of hype around these foods and why we should be um, enjoying them in our diets every day. Now, different foods differ in their abilities to make us feel full. And this can be influenced by things like energy, um, the presence of different macronutrients, like those proteins, those carbs, those fats. Usually there's a reason why with our salads, our vegetables, lean proteins, fruits. We have higher satiety, which is a lot more fullness with those foods compared to a similar amount of high energy dense foods such as biscuits or chocolates with very little nutrients. So the more full we get from a nutrient rich meal, 
the less likely we are to overeat and overeat the foods with no nutritional value. So there's a lot of tips I just gave you, but if I was to cut to the core of all those things and give you just three simple things to walk away with tonight, if you know you are feeling motivated to get onto that nutrition and start working on it, um, you know, start with a food diary. Just being aware of what you're eating um, can allow you to actually track what, when, how much you eat. It can actually be helpful for recognizing patterns of overeating if we're one to emotional eat, which can easily happen when we're in pain or we're feeling upset, we're not feeling motivated, um, which can be related to our condition. You know, a di- something as simple as a diary or reflection can help you foster a better understanding of your dietary habits and help change those future decisions around your diet. The second thing is prioritizing balance. So a nutritionally balanced diet is one that follows Australian dietary guidelines, but could also follow the Mediterranean diet. Should really include healthy foods across all our food groups, vegetables, fruits, whole grains, legumes, um, lean meats, um, fish, olive oil. These all make um, for a good start to the diet. But it should be one that you also enjoy. It should be one that's palatable and something that's sustainable, something that's going to keep you nourished, um, bring in all those essential nutrients, but it's also going to work for you, your lifestyle and your preferences. And so when we do talk, uh, go into the weight management webinar, we'll talk a little bit more about the implications of having such a restrictive, rigid diet and why they basically don't work. Um, hunger check-in before we snack. So overeating, constant snacking, really is a side effect of not eating enough essential nutrients, the good stuff like that protein, good carbs, good fats, um, and eating more sugars and more saturated fats. Again, it could be an emotional stress thing, but in order to prevent this, you know, taking that minute, applying that those mindfulness strategies or techniques um, before we eat can really help you adopt a more flexible and sustainable approach to weight management. So they're just three simple things that you can actually start doing um, throughout your day and you might notice a difference. There is a lot of support out there. So has anyone heard of the Get Healthy service? Yes, I've done it a couple of times. It's fabulous. Yeah, no, it's great to hear you've had um good experience with it. It's a government-led program. It is New South Wales based, and I'm not sure if it would apply for Queen, people in Queensland. Oh. But it's basically a phone service in New South Wales where you can get expert advice from a dietitian or nutritionist to help you achieve your goals. So pretty much it's um I believe it's seven weeks of phone calls to help uh, look at your diet and keep you on track. So this and is they, the number you, you can sorry. call. Yep. I'm sorry. That's okay. They sent me all this fabulous um, information as well about, you know, what to eat and how to eat and everything. Yep. And, Excellent. you know, I'm just uh, checking in with you and everything. It was really brilliant. I did lose weight, but I think I've put it on, all on again now. And you know what? That's a very natural part of it. It happens to a lot of us. We lose weight and then we gain it. So it's really important to try to find an approach that works for you to make it sustainable. So um, if no one, if people haven't heard of it before and you want to get started and you're here in New South Wales, I'll look into what's available in Queensland. I'm sure there's a similar program. But give this number a call. You can jump online and read more about it. The next one is Nutrition Australia. They're a nonprofit organization. They have a lot of different resources, recipes, um, and healthy eating guides, which are easy to download, print out, and use every day. I myself love jumping onto that website and finding a good dinner recipe. That takes you about 10 minutes to throw together, and you know you're getting all your good stuff in it. Um, you can also find a local dietitian. So 
There is um, Dietitians Australia. You can find a dietitian in your area. You can ask your GP, but pretty much um, that will give you the best individualized uh, nutrition advice um, that's applicable to you. So just to sum up uh, what we've covered tonight, nutrition, I hope we understand why it's important in weight management, why weight management is important for arthritis, um, why it's important for inflammation, how it can be effective for symptom management, and that the food choices we make do impact on our health and they do impact on our disease. So what I want to do is open up the floor. I want to um, ask you guys, do you have any questions for me? I don't at this stage, thanks. Okay, I can see at more land, uh, raised hand. Um, my question is in the BMI formula. Um, yeah. Kilo, 25 kilo times M2. Is that M squared or M times two? M squared. And M is the circumference of the waist, is it? It's actually your height. So it's meters squared. Right. So okay. imagine your height, um, 1.75 times 1.75 in brackets, and uh, that should give you your body mass index. Thank you. <laughs> That's okay. Of course, there's lots of calculators out there that easily do it for you. Um, so feel free to use those as well. Oh, I'm just having a look through our comments. See if anything has popped <clears throat> up. I'm crawling up. Just lots of positive changes that have come as a result from weight management. So it's great to hear that you guys have noticed those changes. It says that what um, the recommendations are, they're recommendations really for a reason. They work. Um, are there any studies comparing organic fruit vegetables compared to ordinary fruit and vegetables. Um, Bev, if I'm honest, there's no studies that actually demonstrate there's any difference. It's, as long as you can get those fruits and vegetables in your diet, they're going to be beneficial than not getting them in at all. Whether they're organic or not, um, just be aware that the organic label does come with a price difference. And so that's why we don't um, discriminate against our fruit and veggies. They've all got very powerful properties that go beyond how they're um, grown and harvested and, um, you know, sold to us, really. Um, Jane, Jane, you've raised your hand. But Jane is muted. <laughs> May I speak or no? I, I, we can hear you now. I'm sorry. I'm not Jane. I'm sorry. I'll wait. Julie, was yeah, that but, you? Yes, I'm sorry. I, was, I feel like I'm taking over everybody. I'm, please, I'm sorry. Feel I, free I'll to jump wait. in. What's your question? I just want to know, can I print off um, the notes you know, so I've got, I can keep some notes. I feel okay. I learn better that way. Yeah, okay. Um, what I will encourage you guys to do is after this webinar um, comes to an end, you will receive a link and it, I can't remember if it comes out straight away or if it will come out tomorrow, but there will be a link to the feedback and I'd love to hear your thoughts. I'd love to, um, you know, hear from you about what will make your experience better and if um, supplying these presentation slides will make that better for you and it helps you learn and consolidate everything we've covered, definitely pop that into um, the feedback and then we can make sure we get those out to you. Thank you. And That's thank okay. you very much. It was very enjoyable. I, I, thank you, Julie. I had a question about gluten and if there was yes. any um, research about the link of gluten to osteoarthritis there's actually no link between gluten and osteoarthritis that i'm personally aware of 
Mm-hmm. I know that for some people who have um, an intolerance or um, an allergy to gluten, that can instigate um, an immune response to that particular gluten and it can result in inflammation in the body. And that's why um, it's not a general recommendation we say Mm -hmm. for many people. And that's because many people don't actually have that allergy or intolerance, but for some people um, they do notice a difference once that gluten gets removed from the diet, but usually that's under the supervision of a professional as well. And that's the way to do it. If um, you know, you think you could have a sensitivity Mm -hmm. um, because there can be a lot of implications from eating a, um, dietary component that you have a sensitivity or reaction to um daryl you've actually asked can you recommend a good mediterranean cookbook absolutely so there's one by i believe it's dr Catherine itziopoulos she's a very well established researcher in the mediterranean diet space and she has a great um very affordable uh, cookbook um, that's available online that you can just purchase. And um, I'm pretty sure it's available in stores as well, but it's got a lot of different Mediterranean recipes. And she also talks a little bit about um, the additional benefits of Mediterranean diet as well. Um, Any other questions for me? Uh, thanks, Mary. It was informative. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, everyone, Thank for you. coming tonight. It was great to see you here. I'm looking forward to the rest of the webinars we have scheduled. So I hope to see some of your faces in the future um, webinars. If you have any other questions that come to mind, you can always contact me through info line or at the health email address. So um, feel free to get in touch that way. So we will leave it here tonight, everyone. Again, thank you for coming. Um, it's going to be a very uh, great year ahead of us. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.